Good morning. My name is Holger Neubauer. I'm the preacher of the Church of Christ at Lakeshore in South Haven, Michigan. And we're meeting at the corner of County Road 380 and M140 every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. And we would like to invite you to come to be with us if you are in the area. So we've been doing a series of lessons on the coming of the Lord. We've been talking about a variety of passages, and we have been looking lately at some of the objections that have been made from those who disagree with us, that the Lord's second and final return took place in the fall of the temple in AD 70. One of the first passages which is cited when those want the second coming of the Lord explained to them if he returned in the fall of the temple is found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And particularly, they are interested in the phrase meeting him in the air, where Paul says they would be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so... It's assumed by a casual reading of the text that some kind of rapture event, end of time event, is what Paul has in mind. And at the end of time, Christians will all be catapulted up into the stratosphere to meet the Lord in the air. And if that's so, then the greatest miracle of all time is yet in our future. But in churches of Christ, we confidently affirm that miracles have come to an end. And then those who believe in a future return of Christ are hard pressed to explain how there is yet another miracle in their future. One debater I debated with said, well, it will certainly be supernatural. Well, prayer is supernatural. The word super is from the Latin term supra, just means beyond nature. And of course, we pray for safety, we pray for healing. We're not praying sim simply for doctors to do what they can do best. We're praying for God's and the Lord's superintendence. So he involves himself in the natural world supernaturally. But it's undiscernible, non-discernible. So we can't point to a particular instance like we could in the miraculous age when they had the gift of tongues and prophecies, when the dead were being raised, which cannot be done today, because those signs were to confirm the word, and the word is complete. So my opponents who say, well, it's not miraculous, it's supernatural, really don't know what they're talking about. If 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17 has not yet taken place, then the greatest miracle of all time is in the future of my brethren in churches of Christ who say that the miracles have passed, which is a flat contradiction. But let's look a little bit more closely into the phrase, caught up with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. The first thing that we want to do is to notice the phrase in the air. And we want to notice a similar phrase found in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2. As a matter of fact, it's an identical phrase. Where the Bible speaks about the prince of the power of the air. Now in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, where we have a reference to Satan, who is a prince or ruler of the power of the air, we will point out that no one had to get on a stepladder to meet Satan in the air, because the air is not the air that we breathe there. It is simply the air of a domain. Satan is ruling the age, and he's the prince in the power of the air. And so Jesus is coming, returning in the clouds, and we'll look at that phrase in just a moment and unpack the idea of Jesus coming in the clouds to meet the saints in the very place that Satan had ruled. But Satan was shortly to be crushed. Romans 16 and verse 20. 
And when that took place at the destruction of the temple and the law ended and Satan had no more power to accuse the brethren, his time was short, you remember, and we'll get into these details in just a moment. Jesus overtook Satan in the very domain that he ruled, the air, and he met them in the air. And so we're going to develop that idea today, prove that it's biblical, and in fact, that's what the Bible teaches. And so let us remember that Scripture is to be interpreted by Scripture. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 13, not with words which man's wisdom teaches, but that which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. And so the Holy Spirit taught words, not nudges and hunches. He taught words, and he taught by comparing spiritual things with spiritual. So the spiritual things of Scripture are compared to spiritual things of Scripture, not carnal experiences and carnal experiences. That's not the idea. These are spiritual ideas, and with every event that was transpiring, there was a great spiritual reality behind the scenes, and God was working his work. And so we want to allow Scripture to interpret Scripture and allow God to define God. God has a right to qualify himself, to amplify himself, to modify himself by himself. And God never contradicts himself. And so if there is a contradiction, it's in the way that we're understanding Scripture. But we have to allow God to tell us what he means. Let me give you a for instance. So in the fourth commandment, they were to remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. The sixth commandment said they shall not kill. But what did they do to the individual that violated the fourth commandment? Well, they stoned him, according to Numbers 15, 30 through 35. Now, was it a violation of the sixth command to uphold the consequences for violating the fourth command? No, no. God has a right to qualify, to modify, to amplify himself by himself. And so we're going to do the same thing, allowing God to declare himself, to define himself by himself when we look at the phrase caught up in the air. Now we notice from Acts chapter 1 verses 9 through 11 that the disciples are looking up in the heaven and the angels warn them and admonish them and say why are you gazing up into the heaven? For the same Jesus who they saw ascend would return would come back in like manner. And so many assume from this text that it means that Jesus will be coming exactly in the same way in every detail in a six-foot frame with a Jewish beard, with his wounds in his hands and wounds in his feet, and he would return. Well, that's not the idea at all. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 9, the Bible says, a cloud took him up from their eyes. So the cloud was the means by which Jesus ascended. But in Scripture, when you see a cloud, you always have deity shrouded. So in Matthew 17 and verse 5, we find that the Lord spoke through the cloud. In Exodus 19 and verse 9, the Lord spoke to Moses in a thick cloud. Deity was shrouded. In Isaiah 19 verse 1, when the Lord rode on a swift cloud into Egypt, he was speaking about national judgment language. In Isaiah 19, 21, they would all know in Egypt. They would all know that I am the Lord in Egypt. Well, he came through Assyria. So at about 670 uh, BC, when Sargon led the troops of uh, Syria into Egypt, that prophecy was fulfilled. And so it's the same idea. Jesus now left in a cloud. The cloud shrouded his presence from the very beginning. And as the disciples were looking to heaven, they knew his presence was there, but they couldn't see him because his presence was shrouded, uh, shrouded in a cloud. And he would return in the same way. He would return in a cloud. So in Luke 21, 27, they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with power and great glory. And most of my brethren believe that's the destruction of the city of Jerusalem. He left in a cloud. He came in the cloud. He left and came in the same manner. That is, they didn't see him. They knew he was there when he ascended, and they didn't see him, but they knew he was there when he returned, because the sign of the Son of Man had been fulfilled. What was the sign of the Son of Man? Well, 
when the temple was destroyed, they knew that they would have the presence of Christ. Salvation would have been delivered. And so when that last stone in the temple was pried loose, and Jesus predicted that not one stone would be left upon another, the end would have come. The end of the Jewish age would have come, not the end of the Christian age, uh, of what he was speaking about. So, Jesus left in a cloud, he returns in a cloud. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he's returning in the cloud. And he's returning with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and so he's there with the angels, and he's there in the clouds, and he's there with the trumpets. Well, that's exactly what we find in Matthew chapter 24, verses 30 and 31. We have all the ingredients of the coming of the Lord. Then the sign of the Son of Man shall be seen in heaven. Then all the tribes of the earth land will mourn. Jewish tribes he's talking about. And they will see the Son of Man coming in glory with power, and great glory, and the clouds with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and will gather together his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. So now here we have the clouds, the trumpet being uh, sounded, the angels doing the gathering, the gathering of the elect. Well, that's what we have in First Thessalonians chapter 4. Those who are asleep with Jesus are coming with him. And they are meeting Jesus in the clouds, in the air. And the domain that was ruled by the devil now is ruled by God. And so it is my firm conviction that Matthew 24 and 31, the gathering together of the elect, is the resurrection. Because in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1, Paul says to the Thessalonians who are suffering in their persecution, now concerning the coming of the Lord and our gathering together unto him. Well, the gathering together is resurrection. And it certainly is in that text. So the gathering together of the elect in Matthew 24, verse 31, where Jesus is coming with the clouds and with the angels, is also resurrection. It's the same matter, the gathering together of the elect. Now, just because it happens behind the scenes doesn't mean that it's not a reality. And so at the seventh trump, when comes the end, the seventh angel, we're going to look at that in just a few moments, the dead saints are raised out of Hades. Jesus returns. He was coming this way. We met him in the very domain that Satan ruled, and now we're in an everlasting covenant so we can live with the Lord and never die. If you live and believe in me, you will never die. And so, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That's the idea of what he's saying in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Now, let's break down the verses with a little bit more clarity and a little bit more nuance and go just a bit more slowly, shall we? The Thessalonians were suffering. Paul speaks to the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 3, that none of you should be shaken by these afflictions. And then he speaks about how he warned them that they would suffer tribulation. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 4. So they're suffering. Well, both of the letters of the, Thessalo uh, the Thessalonians, 1 Thess uh, Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians, are written with, within a year of each other. 51 AD and 52 AD. They are the earliest of the letters that Paul writes. And they are suffering persecution. But in the second Thessalonian letter, which is written one year later, he speaks about that it was a righteous thing with God to repay tribulation to those that trouble you. Now, the word tribulation and trouble is from the same Greek word, thlipsis. And so, so those who are receiving tribulation would receive tribulation in the same way. Those that had killed would be killed. Those that had persecuted would be persecuted. Well, the question is, who was persecuting the Thessalonians? In Acts chapter 17, we find that Paul enters into the synagogue at Thessalonica because he always goes to the Jew first, then to the Greek, and he reasons with them for three Sabbath days. 
You remember in Acts 13, 46, it was necessary that the gospel be first preached to you that because you reject it, you deem yourselves unworthy, you judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. Paul always go to the Jew first because it's their age. He does so with the Thessalonians as he enters into the city. And so he's there for three Sabbath days reasoning and then the Jews become envious because the devout Greeks, who are proselytes, they're also meeting on the Sabbath day, are now converted. So the Jews send men from the marketplace, baser men, men of a baser sort, a lower sort of living, men who could be bought to cause persecution for Paul and his company. And then we find that Jason has to make some kind of security that uh, promises Paul and his company company will not return. So Paul will write in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse uh, 18, we wanted to come to you again, but Satan hindered us. Well, who hindered them? Well, in Acts 17 and verse 8, they troubled the people. Who troubled the people? The Jews did. Do you see that Satan was operating through the Jewish authorities to keep the kingdom down? They were persecuting the church. So Satan is working through the Jewish authorities. And the Thessalonians are suffering. Well, in 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 6, those who were giving the persecution would be repaid in kind. With the same kind of persecution they received, they would receive. So it's a righteous thing with God to pray with tribulation, those who give you tribulation, literally in 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6. Well, how would it be repaid? It would be repaid at the coming of our Lord in our gathering together to him. But they were suffering. Is Jesus saying, well, you'll suffer and you'll die, and then 2,000 years later you'll get your reward? Or 4,000 years later? Or 10,000 years later? No, they were suffering, and Jesus was coming to relieve their, their suffering. So Paul speaks in 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 1. And he says, now concerning the coming of the Lord, and our gathering together unto him. Jesus was coming to reveal the man who was sitting in the temple of God, claiming to be God. Second Thessalonians 2 and verse 4. Who was in the temple of God? Well, the high priest was in the temple of God. He's the 666 man of Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. Six is a temple number. I've written about that in my book. If you want a copy, reach out on Facebook and I'll send you a copy. Six is a temple number. 666 talents of gold was the temple tax. 1 Kings 10, 14. And the nuances continue on and on and on and on. And so the man sitting in the temple of God is the man who is now ordering the persecution in the great tribulation period. The Thessalonians were suffering in the tribulation. In Revelation chapter 1 and verse 9, John was in the tribulation. And he's writing to the seven churches of Asia because all of those churches have a Jewish base, and Rome allowed the Jewish authorities to persecute their own. So the high priest is now in the temple of God, claiming that he has the position of God, but he has resisted Christ. He is persecuting the saints, and he's sending persecution all over the world, and whenever a Jew obeys the gospel and becomes a Christian, they suffer persecution. And so before the church ever had one Gentile in it, for 12 years it was completely Jewish. So Cornelius doesn't come in until 45 AD, a full 12 years after Pentecost. So we have to understand that the church has a Jewish base. And that's the basis of the suffering. And they are suffering in a time of unique persecution and tribulation. So in 1 Thessalonians 3 and verse 4, they're in tribulation, they're in afflictions, which Paul predicted, he said. In 2 Thessalonians 1 verse 6, the tribulation would be repaid with tribulation, and it would be repaid at the second coming of Christ. He's coming in flaming fire. Well, in Isaiah 66 verses 15 and 16, the Lord is coming in a fire and in his chariots. He would plead with all flesh with a sword, and with fire, Isaiah 66 and verse 16. That was coming to pass when the old Jewish age was coming to an end and Satan was about to be punished. 
And so the 666 man is the instrument of Satan. He's claiming to be God. He's fighting against Christ. He's fighting against the kingdom. And Rome is giving him his power to do so. That's the sea beast of Revelation chapter 13. And the land beast is Judaism ruled by the 666 man. Now the sea beast gives the power to the land beast for people to worship him. That's what he did. So the high priest demanded authority and honor and respect to the law. And those who didn't were persecuted. Many of them were killed. But soon Jesus was going to be revealed to take him out of the way to take the high priest and the Jewish authorities out of the way. And so we find this whore who rode on the back of this fourth world empire would uh, have the four, four world, fourth world empire turn on him and hate the whore that rode on that beast back. Well, the whore is Judaism. She rode on Rome's back militarily, monetarily, and politically. They killed Jesus through the Roman authorities. They were using the Roman money of the day. You remember Jesus asked for the coin. It was Caesar's superscription. And Roman had uh, the Roman powers had given the Jewish church their place and their power. John 11 and verse 45. And the Jews said, if we leave him alone, Rome will come take our place and our power. So Rome, the sea beast, had given the land beast its power, and the land beast is the harlot. That's what Revelation chapter 17 is all about. So at the coming of the Lord, thus that man is revealed, and those individuals in the city of Jerusalem are all killed. Now, how did that affect the Thessalonians? Well, the Thessalonians were suffering from a Jewish persecution, proven by Acts chapter 17. They're the ones that trouble the people. Now, in the last Passover feast, the Jewish authorities all traveled to Jerusalem. Jesus said in Luke 21, these be the days of vengeance that all things which are written might be fulfilled. Luke 21 and verse 20. In verse 21, in those days, they are supposed to flee to the mountains. If you're in Judea, flee to the mountains. If you're in the countryside, you're not supposed to enter her, and if you're in the midst, depart out, all right? So for that last Passover feast, they're not to go to the Passover feast. Remember Numbers chapter 9, we find that the Passover feast was qualified. So they weren't supposed to go to that last Passover feast, the Jews, although they did so year after year after year while the law was still operating. But for that last Passover feast, they did not attend. Jesus warned them not to attend. And Titus let the pilgrims to come in, but he would not let them out. And all the Jewish authorities all over the ancient world were there in Jerusalem. And Jesus revealed himself in flaming fire, in clouds, because he's the one that orchestrated the event. As Jerusalem burned and the Jewish leaders were put down. That's what First and Second Thessalonians is all about. And behind the scenes, there was a greater spiritual reality because Jesus was giving his salvation presence to the church. Now, the Bible speaks about one unique time of trouble. The Old Testament predicts it. Daniel chapter 12, verse 2, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation even to that same time. In Joel chapter 2, the like of whom has never been, uh, nor never ever will be. It's the same time period. You cannot have unequal parallel persecution and have reference to different times. And Joel is speaking about the same time that Daniel is speaking about. And again, Jeremiah chapter 30 and verse 7, Alas, the day is great. And why do I see every man with his hands on his loins and every face pale? Because... A man is about to give birth in a unique way that's never taken place. It's, alas, the day is great. It's the time of Jacob's trouble. So there's a unique place uh, and period of persecution coming. The Thessalonians are in the persecution. Revelation 1.9, John is in the tribulation. 1 Corinthians 7.26, they're in the present distress. The 40-year transition period of great persecution, which would birth a new 
reality. And so it's like the time of the birth pangs, Matthew 24, verse 8. It would be a time of sorrows, birth pangs. Well, what happens in the birth pangs? Well, a woman experiences um, the pregnancy pains. They become more intense, closer together before the child is born. And then the child will be born. That's exactly what Jesus says in Matthew 24. And he's speaking about gospel evangelism to the Jewish diaspora. Well, at Thessalonica, they are the Jewish diaspora. Paul enters into the synagogue for three Sabbath days, reasons about them about the gospel, and the devout Greeks obey the gospel. All right? Then they're persecuted. Well... In Matthew 24, and verse 36, no one knows the day and the hour, just like a woman's birth pangs. You know a child is going to be born, but you know that when the birth pangs become more intense and more severe and closer together, that the child is going to arrive. So they didn't know the day and the hour. They knew the general signs, but you don't know the day and the hour of a child's birth until the last very day. So the 40-year transition is like the 40-week period of a woman's gestation period. And these are not just similarities. They are there for a reason, for us to see a picture of what was taking place in the ancient world. The great tribulation period, the great time of the birth pangs, a new reality would soon be seen, and soon the birth of the sun would come. Now, let's get back to Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 2, shall we? I think I've already gone uh, nearly 30 minutes, so let me hurry. Paul speaks about the prince of the power of the air, ruling the air, of course. Satan is ruling the air. And yet Jesus says in John 12 and verse 31, now is the judgment of this world, literally a present tense verb. Now is the judging of this world and the prince or ruler of this world is cast out. So what world was Jesus in? He's in the Jewish world. The ruler of that world, the prince, the power of the air, was about to be cast out. In Luke 10 and verse 18, I saw Satan falling. The ruler of this world is judged, John 16 and verse 11. Now, the question is, when would he be judged? In Romans 16 and verse 20, the Bible says, The God of peace shall crush Satan under your feet shortly. From the Greek word to Cain, what does shortly mean? It means the same thing as it meant in 2 Peter 1.14, when Peter said, the Lord has shown me that I must put off my tabernacle shortly. Not 2,000 years. It was a short period of time. Satan had a short time in Revelation 12.12. The woman had fled into the wilderness there. You remember to give birth to his son for the 1,290 days, the 42 months, the times, times and a half a time, the Jewish war from 66 to 70. It all fits like a hand and a glove. So Satan was going to be crushed, the Greek word son trebo. What was the promise that the Lord made in Genesis 3.15? Speaking to the devil, I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between her seed and your seed. And it shall bruise your head, or, or her seed. It shall bruise your head, and you shall bru bruise his heel. All right? Satan would get a death blow, the bruising or the crushing of the head. When was the crushing of Satan? Romans 16, 20, it would shortly take place. Satan was shortly to be crushed. And that word crushed is the Greek word sontribo. It's used in Mark 14, verse 3, when the woman broke the alabaster box in order to anoint Jesus. It means crushed. Can't ever put it back together. Satan is crushed. His power is taken away. Romans 16 and verse 20 promises it. Did the Lord keep his promises? Yes. In Revelation chapter 20, in the little time of the great persecution tribulation period, which Jesus said would take place before the fall of the temple, he had a little, little time. And the little, little time is not in our future. The little, little time was the 66 to 70 period where Satan was leashed out in great persecution. In 1 Peter 5, 9, Satan was roaring about. He was working through the Jewish authorities. 
The man sitting in the temple is the 666 man. Satan is ruling in the old kingdom. They want to keep everyone in bondage. The city which is spiritually called Sodom and Egypt, where also our Lord was crucified, was keeping men in bondage under the law. They were resisting the kingdom. They were killing the Christians. And soon that age would come to an end. And Satan's rule was taken away. And the very place that Satan ruled was now ruled by Christ because his kingdom had been consummated in the air, in the air. There's another nuance that has to be understood, and that's the air of Revelation chapter 16. Now, in Revelation chapter 16, we find that the Lord is coming as a thief, Revelation 16, 15. But in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 2, he speaks about the thief coming. So it's talking about the same event. And there he says, you brethren are not in darkness that the day overtake you as a thief. You see, they knew, the Christians knew that Jesus was coming. The coming was at hand. It was the disobedient that rejected the coming of the Lord, especially the disobedient Jews, the sons of darkness and the sons of the kingdom that would manifest when Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would sit down and they would be cast out. Matthew 8, 11, and verse 12. Well, in Revelation 16, 15, I'm coming as a thief. It's the same coming of 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 2. And there he says that your whole body, spirit, and soul be preserved to the coming of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 20. Well, wait a minute. If he says your whole soul, spirit, and body are preserved to the coming of the Lord, and he wishes that for the Thessalonians, is he telling them to get a good mortician so that their bodies are preserved for the coming of the Lord for thousands of years? No, that's not the idea, you see. Jesus was coming to meet them. The clouds would shroud his presence. He would meet them in the domain that Satan ruled in the air. And that's proven by Revelation chapter 16, 15. I'm coming as a thief. Well, who's he going to overcome in Revelation 16, 15? The Bible says in verse 6, For they have shed the blood of the saints and the prophets, and you have given them blood to drink. Ah, that's 2 Thessalonians 1, verse 6. It's a righteous thing to repay with tribulation those that trouble you. And so now... You've taken their blood, they are going to shed their own blood. What did Jesus say? That you have persecuted the righteous men I send to you, and all the blood from righteous Abel to Zechariah, son of Berechiah, whom you slew between the temple and the altar, will be required of this generation. Jesus said, I send to you scribes and wise men some of them you will kill and crucify and scourge them in your cities uh, scourge them in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city and yet jesus said to those that same uh group in matthew 10 23 you shall not gone over the cities of israel till the son of man be come and he was speaking about the persecution and their evangelism some of them would die not all of them most of them would die but some of them would not and so before all of them were killed, Jesus was coming. And he would relieve them of their persecution. That's what Matthew 10, 23 is all about. And that's what Matthew 16, 27, and 28 is about. Mark 8, 38, Mark 9, 1 is about. Coming in his kingdom. Not Pentecost. The kingdom coming when Jerusalem fell, Luke 21, 31. So let's go back to Revelation 16. So... They had shed the blood of the saints and the prophets. There are no prophets living after AD 70. The prophetic office comes to an end. I've done a video on that. Zechariah 13, verse 5. They would no longer wear a rough garment to deceive. Daniel 9 and 24. Uh, the prophecy would be sealed up. Micah 7, 15. According to your days coming out of Egypt, I will show unto him marvelous things. Forty years, miracles. Spiritual gifts of the coming of the Lord. 1 Corinthians 1, 6 through 8. Even as the testimony uh, was confirmed in you, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall confirm you to the end. They were confirming through the gifts. The gifts to the end. The end of the age. You see, that's what he's speaking about. So now, Revelation 16. He's coming as a thief. He's going to now pay them back with blood because they've taken blood. Jesus said it was the Jewish state that was responsible for all the blood of the saints. And they were filling up the measure. And finally they filled up the measure. 
and as he sent unto them scribes and wise men and prophets. They killed those individuals too and they filled up the measure and now the measure is full. That's what Revelation chapter 14 is about. The wine of his wrath without measure. It's not poured out because they're guilty of uh, taking innocent blood and the blood of the prophets. It's not the Catholic Church. There was no pope in the first century. The first pope was not actually uh, conferred till Boniface the third of 606 AD. He's not talking about the Catholic Church. He's talking about the Jewish state and the Jewish leaders. Now, the Bible says in verse 16, they gathered them together to the place in the Hebrew, Armageddon, the battle of Armageddon. It literally means the battle of the mountain or the battle of the troops at the mountain. What mountains he's talking about? He's talking about Zion. It's Joel chapter 3, the valley of decision. It is the valley of uh, Jehoshaphat. Joel 3, 12, the valley, the valley of Jehoshaphat, the great battle, the valley of decision. And it's that time of the Lord shall roar from Zion. He's talking about judgment coming, spiritual gifts again. The Holy Spirit comes in the last days of Israel, Joel 2, 28 through 32, culminated by an unequal day of persecution, Joel 2, verse 2. And then the great battle would be fought. Outside of Zion, Zion is where the temple is built. That first temple destroyed, now the new temple is manifest. It's a spiritual idea, you see. And so this great battle was fought. Zechariah 14, 2, the nations will come against Jerusalem. Zechariah 12, and verse 2, the day I will besiege Jerusalem and Judah. That's the day that he would open a fountain for sin and uncleanness. It's the day that the prophet would um, go out of the land. The, the false prophet would no longer prophesy. He would no longer wear a rough garment to deceive. It's the day that the nations came against Jerusalem. The houses are rifled. The women are ravaged. It's a day known to the Lord, Zechariah 14, 7. He was coming with his saints, Zechariah 14, 5. He was coming to be king over all the earth, Zechariah 14, 9. And there would be no utter destruction after that. And then those who were left would worship in a new way, left spared, taken judged. That's the idea. So, Revelation chapter 16 speaks about a time where the battle of armageddon is fought not in our future it was in their past it was when the nations came against jerusalem to the holy mountain that's what the word means then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air judgment came into the air into the domain where the devil had ruled through the jewish authorities for way too long and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying it is done now, there are seven seals in the book of Revelation. There are seven trumpets in the book of Revelation. And there are seven bowls of wrath in the book of Revelation. But don't pronounce the book with an S. Because it's one revealing of Christ. And the seven seals mirror the seven trumpets, which mirror the seven bowls of wrath. They are different ways of speaking about the same thing. So the seventh seal lines up with the seventh trump of the angel, which lines up with the seven bowls of wrath, the seventh bowl of wrath, the end being poured out. It's simply the repetition of the same event. And at the seventh bowl, at the seventh trump, the last trump when it's finished, it was done because the bowl of judgment was poured into the air, into Satan's domain. That's what he's speaking about. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings and a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. That's the unique day of the persecution and judgment before Jerusalem would fall. It's Joel 2.2. It's Jeremiah 36 and 7. It's Daniel 12, 2, coming to its, uh, its end, its culmination, its consummation. That's what he's referencing. And then the, the great city was divided into three parts. 
Josephus records how the city was divided by John of Gisharla, who warred against uh, Eliezer ben Simon, uh, Simon and uh, Simon Bargora. You see, when Jerusalem fell, one of the reasons that it was so devastating is because not only did the Jews do war against the Romans, there were three factions of Judaism fighting for control. There was civil war inside the city. And that's why the, the famine was so uh, great. And that's why the suffering was so great. They killed one another while Rome came and destroyed them. And each faction believed that God was on their side. If they could only win, they could win over the Romans. Well, they were wrong. They all rejected Jesus, you see. And that's what that's all about. And then he says that every island fled away and the mountains were not found. Those are the old authorities of the Jewish age. Mountains are authorities. Babylon was called a destroying mountain in Jeremiah 51, verse 25. And the islands are simply uh, places of rule of the mountains. So the islands outside the sea and the Gentile lands, they could no longer persecute them. All right. The mountain of Judaism had now come to an end. Jesus said, if you have the faith, like the seed of a mustard seed, nature of the kingdom, you're going to say to that mountain, be removed. That persecuting power and that government, which seemed that they couldn't overcome it, would be removed, thrown into the sea among the Gentiles. And so that persecution came to an end. In Revelation chapter 16 and verse 21, a great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. The Roman catapults could throw stones about 300 yards away. And in the evening time, the dark, uh, when night came, they painted the stones black so they couldn't see the stones hurled to them. And the Jews said, Josephus records, the sun comes. Many of them believed that they were paying the penalty for crucifying the Messiah. Well, I'm going to leave you with that study. There's a lot of information, but the phrase, meet him in the air, in the clouds, at the last trump, does not have reference to a great miracle at the end of time. Jesus was returning this way, in the very domain that Satan at one time ruled, and he was shortly to be crushed. Romans 16, verse 20, and all of his power taken from him, because the law had come to an end, took place when the temple fell. And today Christ, Christ rules in the air in the spiritual domain. And the cloud shrouds the presence of Christ. We don't see him, but he's here. He's here with us in a completed kingdom, in a completed salvation. And if you live and believe in him, you will never die. And your enemy has already been destroyed, not physical, biological death, covenant death. We're free from the law. We have a wonderful, wonderful promise in Christ. And now we have all of the promises of God fulfilled. Let me just say this about Satan. Remember the first time I was studying this, I was taken back a bit. Asked myself the question, is Satan destroyed? I had built an entire theology around Satan. You see, Satan has no power over Christians today. In the same way that Hitler has been destroyed, though we have Nazis running around, Hitler's gone. Satan is gone. Do we have individuals that follow his ideas? They have no real power. It's just an evil idea. And our kingdom message is so much stronger that we can rule over our enemies, get the gospel message out there, preach the message, we'll rule over our enemies. And Satan has been destroyed, and Jesus now has returned and has the dominion over the very place that was given up by the devil that was uh, destroyed, as Satan uh, was destroyed at the, when the temple fell. I'm Holger Neubauer, your host. You can call me at 269-325-4449. Hopefully you've enjoyed the study. May God enrich your studies. We'll see you again soon.